Resurrection Church. How are we doing today? Talk about everybody's favorite thing to talk about in church. Money. money. <laughs> the reason a lot of us don't like to hear about money is when we hear about money in church, we immediately think the church is trying to get stuff from us. The church is trying to take from us. We, the, the offerings must be low. Uh, the pastor must have gotten a raise. And, and these tend to be the things that we think about because we've seen uh, the guy that's on TV that's asking you to give out of uh, the abundance of your money so that they can buy the jet that God told them they needed to go do ministry. And I understand that. So today I want to do two things. I want to not give you a bunch of ideas that I am not practicing. So I want to talk practically about how my wife and I strive to be generous, number one. And number two, uh, I also want to read a lot of Bible. The reason we're talking about debt and being generous now, right now at the Christmas season, it, it comes from this article I read last year about Christmas and the American uh, population. It says this, this is from January 2nd, 2008 from Market Watch. Shoppers in the U.S. racked up an average of $1,054 in debt last Christmas. That's an increase of 5% over last year. It found that 44% of shoppers racked up more than $1,000 in holiday debt and 5% accumulated, they went all in, they, they accumulated more than $5,000 in debt. So you always see the uh, car commercials. Apparently those that accumulated more than $5,000 in debt actually bought the car and put the bow on it, uh, which sounds like a really good idea, but that's a lot of money. Now the question that we should ask ourselves if we're Christians is simply this. Does God care whether or not we are generous? Does it matter to God how we spend our money? Does it matter to God how we use our money either to make an eternal impact or for temporary, temporary, temporal things. And the answer to all these things in church, because I'm hearing you say them, are yes, God cares about how we live, and, and particularly if we're generous or not generous. And here's the problem. Christmas is a season where we can handicap our generosity for months. Of those that spent over $1,000 in debt, only half of those were expected to repay it within the first three months of the year. So that means at a minimum, those that racked up $1,000 worth of credit card debt at Christmas last year, the handicap their ability to be generous in January, February, and March. On top of that, 29% said it would take them five months to pay back the debt. So January, February, March, April, and May to pay back the debt. Uh, another uh, 10% said they could only afford to pay the minimum payment on their credit card for the debt that they incurred, which means for the next five years, they're going to pay an extra $500 for the $1,000 that they spent this past Christmas. They'll still be paying for Tickle Me Elmo in 2023. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. You cannot be generous and be in debt. Debt and generosity are not friends. And today, what I want you to hear is that God cares about how we live and how we spend our money, and he's called us in response to the generosity that he's given us in Jesus to live generous lives. And so I want to ask you a question I asked at the beginning of 2018, and it's simply this. What is your intentional plan for generosity this year? What has that plan been? I get this from Isaiah chapter 32, verse 8. If you look in your Bibles, Isaiah 32, 8, it says this. It's been a foundational verse for my family. It's a verse that me and my wife uh, come back to on a frequent basis in our own home. And it's this. It says, a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. None of us are generous on accident. Like, I've never met anyone that woke up on a Monday and said, man, how do we get so crazy at the Salvation Army just making it rain to help, help them out? With great generosity comes great intentionality. So those that you see around, because all of us see rich people that are generous, and we would be generous too if we were rich, which is what all of us say. Which, by the way, I just want to make sure you understand, if you live in America and you make minimum wage, you're in the top 95% of wage earners in the world. The top 5%, excuse me. So all that 1% talk about the one percenters that have all the money, what you need to know is that from the world standard, you're basically a one percenter. So if we don't have room to be generous, then no one in the world has room to be generous. Because we're the most wealthy people in the world 
Yet for many of us, generosity is something for rich people to do, and we don't recognize the fact that we're actually rich. Just go ahead and look at your neighbor and be like, neighbor, congratulations, you're rich. Go ahead and let them know. In fact, you can go ahead and say to them, neighbor, I don't know if you know this, but you're sitting by a rich person. Some of y'all are looking at each other like, yeah, I know I've been sitting by a rich person. Like, there's a little bit of a begrudging coming with that. Here's the thing I'm trying to get across to you. If you're going to live a generous life, it won't come with more money. It will come with more planning. A generous life will not come with more money. It will come with more planning. A generous man devises generous things, devises generous things plans. So what has been your plan for generosity in 2018? Let me go ahead and tell you, if you didn't have a plan for generosity in 2018, that your plan to not have a plan has led to a plan, and that's called the plan to fail at being generous. Now that's offensive to us because we like to think that if we are momentarily generous, that that makes us a generous person. It's the same as saying like, well, if I'm mostly faithful to my wife, that means I'm pretty much faithful. It don't work that way in the Chambers household. I I would not be in the house if I functioned off of that same thing. So just because uh, Mandisa got up and sang an American Idol and you text to give $15 earlier this year, it does not mean you are a generous person. Just because you gave a little bit of money and you threw it out of your pocket to a homeless person on the street, that does not make you a generous person. Generosity varies from person to person. What, means, what, what, what is generous for me may be selfish for you. We learn this from the parable of the widow's mite, right? When Jesus talks about some people that were in the temple, and a man walked up with a bag of money, and he just simply mindlessly grabs in the bag and throws some money in the offering plate, and then walks away. But then a woman who had nothing but one widow's mite, one mite, walks up and takes that mite and puts it in. And what does Jesus teach in that story? Who was generous? The man who threw many coins or the woman who threw one? You see, when it comes down to it, generosity, by definition, is exceeding the expected. It's whenever you go to the extent of giving beyond what was expected. And in that moment, that's when you cross into generosity. I want to be very clear. I'm not talking to you about tithing today in the church That's Old Testament teaching. I'm talking about New Testament generosity, which exceeds it. Let let me explain this. Me and my wife sit down every single year, and we evaluate what we've done in the last year, and we make plans for generosity going into the new year. So we sit down. Usually, we've done this at Cafe Med in years past. This year, we did it at five bucks while my parents were out here. We took five bucks, paid it for a 99 cent, maybe, uh, cup of coffee, and sat down, and we talked about Uh, our our goals for 2018, the places that we were able to give and make a difference, the Bakersfield Pregnancy Center under his umbrella and our kid Prince that we've sponsored through under under his umbrella that we've watched grow up now for the last several years, Uh, the the local radio station that we tend to be very uh, big fans of, 88.3 Life FM. We we talked about about our, our giving to the church. And here's what we did. We didn't assume that This year's generosity, which was obedience to God as God set the standard for us, would be acceptable next year. We consistently are asking God, we do this monthly and annually, God, are we continuing to be generous at your standard? This is spirit-led giving versus guilt-led giving. A study came out and found that for baby boomers, most baby boomers give out of a motivation of guilt. The more guilty you feel, the more money you give. The same study also found that with millennials, millennials tend to operate and give out of emotion. The more emotion you feel, the warm and fuzzies, the goosebumps, the more you give. It's why the telethons like American Idol can raise millions in a moment for Haiti. Why? Because millennials like text to give, yeah, and then we'll pay our credit card, or we'll pay our phone bill on our credit card and finance it for five years, which isn't actually generous. It's actually misstewardship. This make sense? I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens from you today, but a holy nod or two would help. Generous is not guilt-driven giving. That's not generous. 
That's just you trying to appease God so that he'll leave you alone. In the same way, emotional giving is not generous giving. There's no intentionality to it. It's just spur of the moment. So you can be generous in a moment and then in the next moment, not because you made a plan and knew you were sacrificing, but because you were careless and didn't have a plan and then you threw money at something, then you find yourself in trouble. Does this make sense? Generous is right in the middle of the two. Generous is spirit-led. It's God-initiated. It's I've freely received, now I can freely give. That's generous. Generosity looks different from person to person. What does it look like for you to be generous? Have you really taken time to ask that question? Now, my wife and I sat down and we celebrated what God had done in the past year. We then began to pray about what God would have us do this year. And we set some goals financially of some things that we wanted to add into our generosity portfolio. We want to increase our 1% giving that we're giving, setting aside for our neighbor. Remember that? I challenged our church early in the year to set aside 1% of your income for your neighbor. That's right. I'm asking you to do more with your money than give it to the church. And we're asking you to give to the church, to be very clear. Like, you don't take away from here to go over here. Like, no, we, my wife and I set a standard of giving that we believe the Lord has led us to do it, and we believe it's our job to be lead givers in this church. So you know what that means? We are constantly increasing that percentage prayerfully as the Lord leads us. At one point in time, before kids, we were giving 20% of our income to our church. Then we had kids. And they got expensive. And the hardest thing to do was to be spirit-led and allow the Lord to lead us to bring that number back. And now we are aggressively moving forward to bring that number back up as the Lord leads. But listen to me. The Lord sets the standard, not guilt, not guilt, not baseline obedience. We give above and beyond baseline obedience, which is above our tithe to the church. And, And we don't give out of just simply emotion. Oh, I didn't know there was a need. Let me now throw money at it and be the superhero and feed my complex which is what happens with a lot of millennials. Does this make sense? So we sat down and we began to pray, God, what would you have us do? How can we increase our generosity portfolio? Now, we have not always operated this way. We used to live closed hand around our money. We weren't generous to anyone. Now, we thought we were generous because we would throw a $5 bill out to a homeless man, but we didn't give a dime to our church. We spent more on toilet paper than we spent on our neighbor. I'm letting that sink in, because for some of you, that's your reality. Seriously, we have no margin to help our neighbor, no margin that we set aside. We we, we literally consume everything we get, and then we say, well, if we made more money, we're going to come back to that idea in just a second, then we would be generous to our neighbor, then we would think about generosity, but we didn't have no margin to be generous. Again, generosity is you allowing God to set a standard of giving for you that is baseline obedient, but then exceeds it. Because if all we're doing is being baseline obedient, we're just simply doing what's been asked of us. I don't want to live that kind of life. I want to be a generous person. I want to experience God's best life for me, not my best life. So that means I don't assume that everything I make is mine to consume. So we set out to make a plan for generosity going into 2018. But when we didn't, when we didn't do this int- with intentionality, here's what we found our life to be filled with. You ready? Arguments, worry, and stress. Do you know why? We were a part of the great American pastime called smudgeting. You ever heard of smudgeting? Smudgeting is when you basically set a number of dollars that you can spend without paying attention to how you spend them, and then when you hit that number, you begin to freak out. So we would basically say, oh, we could spend about 450-ish. And then we'd go and have a great time, and at the end of the weekend, we would have spent $450, and that was our entire week and a half budget. So then we would freak out, eat the end pieces of the bread, and cry out to God as if he had forsaken us. Lord, help us! We're scraping the peanut butter jar and eating end pieces of the bread. And that all came because we had a smudge it, not a budget. You can't be generous if you do not tell your money where to go. It says in the Proverbs to take an account for the flocks that you have. Take an account for the possessions God has given you. Steward them. How many of you have parents that constantly were on you about taking care of your stuff? They were trying to teach you a biblical principle. That principle is stewardship. 
my son loves cars, like the little Mattel Matchbox cars, and particularly the cars from the Disney movie Cars 3 and Cars 2. Loves them. We have thousands of these suckers. I've stepped on them in the middle of the night and about like lost my salvation. Like they're everywhere. We're constantly telling him, take care of your stuff. When our kids come to us and they can't find their stuff, we look at them and say, it's not our job to keep up with your stuff. You take care of I'm preaching for the parents, and every parent say amen in right now. Why? It's your job to care for it. So the other day, my son loses his car, and he goes, well, we'll just buy another one. I said, no, we will not. That's not the way this works, buddy. You mismanage what you got, you don't get more. That's not the way it works. You steward what you've got. Now, every parent that just amen, I want you to be clear that God's amening the idea of you having an intentional plan for generosity. And if you don't have one and you're complaining to God about a lack of money, you shouldn't be surprised that you've mismanaged what God gave you and he's not given you more. So there was a major mind, uh, mind shift that had to happen when it came to the way my wife and I looked at money when we weren't honoring God. Versus where we are now where we're trying to test God and push into living a generous life. And here's what had to happen. There were three things that changed in the way that we viewed our possessions and our money and our paycheck and our raises and our recessions and everything in between. You ready? The three changes. Number one, we began to view all of our possessions as if God owns them. So we stopped looking at it like the birds from Nemo and everything was mine, 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 mine. And we began to look at it as it's yours, 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 yours. So when we get a raise, we stopped assuming that the raise was for the boat. Every time we fell into mailbox money, because everyone's had that moment where they open up the mailbox and surprise, here's a dollar. <laughs> right? We didn't assume that that was so that we could go to Chick-fil-A. Although that's, a, I mean, usually a, a, a result that's down the path, not far from it. Right? Instead, we started assuming that God owns everything. Therefore, God, if you're giving it to us, what do you want us to do with it? Instead of waiting until we spent what we wanted and found the leftovers to then offer to God, we started with what God gave us and said, God, what do you want us to do with what you've given us? It was a major change in our marriage. It was a major change in our life and in our money management. After all, Deuteronomy 10, 14 says it this way, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Job 41, 11, When Job begins to question God about his circumstances, God looks at Job and says, Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole earth is mine. There is nothing in your life that God doesn't rightly look at and say mine. And look, we're not streaming this, so I can walk. Let me get grill in your grill for a second. Some of you, listen to me, the biggest frustration you can ever hear a pastor say to you is that there's stuff in your life that you've been holding on to and clinging on to. I'm trying to get close to you because I want you to see my face right now. And you're like, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And then you hear the pastor say, no, it's God's. And you're like, mmm. And you throw a tantrum, and you leave the church, and you get angry and frustrated, and you're like, they only talk about money at the church. And what actually happened is the idol of your heart got exposed. Because Jesus said in the Bible that you can't serve both God and money. You'll love one and hate the other. And you got exposed, and instead of repenting, you ran. So every bit of your life belongs to him. You want to trust him with all the junk, but you don't want to trust him with the benefits of your life. You want to bring him your sin, but you don't expect him to also take your gifts and redeem them for his purpose. You want him to take care of your debt, but you don't expect for him to honor you and your for, for, for you to honor him in your wealth. What kind of arrogance is that? What are we doing? God owns everything. That's why Colossians says, in whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. No matter what you do. So when you buy Christmas presents, do it to the glory of God. When you make a budget, budget to the glory of God. 
when you look at the rays, uh, assess the rays and what you do with it to the glory of God. Stop making it about you. And stop getting mad at a pastor for speaking truth to you. Well, I don't trust pastors and what they do with the money. Well, let me be very clear. I don't touch it. <sighs> None of that. We have a volunteer team that handles every dime that comes in the door to this church. I'm, a, I'm as far away from it as I can. Listen to me. At the end of the day, some people are like, well, the reason I can't be generous is because people just are greedy. Let me be clear. The answer is yes. All humans are greedy. Every one of us are. But obedience isn't removed because of the greediness of people. Your call to be obedient is not removed because of the greediness of people. In fact, Ed Cole went on to say this. After giving something to God, you are no longer accountable for it. Your blessing is based on your giving, not on what others do with the gift. Now, I'm all for accountability. We should be smart and prayerful in everything that we give to. Every organization my wife and I add to our generosity portfolio that we give to, whether it's the Bakersfield Pregnancy Center or under his umbrella, we research, we pray about them, we look into how much of the money when we give it is actually getting to the mission field, how much is going to operational expenses. We look at these things, and then through that, we steward our money to make sure it's making the maximum impact possible. Why? Because we want to be generous. And good stewards of what God has given us. But the shift for us happened when we actually began to view our possessions, not in church speak, but in our actual lives as if they all belong to God. Now let me ask you a question. When you get more money, what is usually the first thing you do? Do you plot how you're going to spend it? Right? It's the American pastime. It's what we do. We buy a lottery ticket, which gives us no chance of winning. And we sit around the whole afternoon going, well, I would do this, and I would, of course, be generous. I'm going to give a lot to the church. I'm going to give a lot. Right? We plot. We, some of you spent the race before you got the race. It's like Christmas vacation, right? Like you expected a big enough race to, to pay for the pool, and then you got like a $100 check. It's it's like a national pastime. I mean, let's be honest. What do you do whenever you hear or whenever you find that you've just got a little bit more money? You immediately think to spend it. You have conversations about what you'll do. Let me ask you this question. Whenever you need more money, what's the first thing you do? You cry out to God, Lord, help me! Rain your blessings down on me, Father. Isn't, Isn't it interesting or odd That the first thing you do when you get more is stop talking to God, and the first thing you do when you need more is you start talking to Him. Now, if I were a good father that wanted you to have conversations with me, let's say, unceasingly, and I wanted you to depend on me as if I were Lord, why would I give you more money to not talk to me? Oh, I'm preaching good today. I mean, you you may not come back, but that's fine. I mean... Why would I give you more if you mismanage and move your heart away from me with what I've already given you? See, just because God gives you something to steward, it doesn't mean that you are free from the consequences of mismanaging what is rightfully His. So for Morgan and I, the move towards generosity began with this realization that God truly owns everything. Number two, we also then realized that God controls everything. He owns it, he controls it. You own a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of stuff you can't control, right? Like you can own a piece of land, but then the land gets burned up or flooded, and then it gets ruined and devalued. You have no control over that. Here's what's great about God. God owns it, and he controls it. Frees you to give. How how can you be freed up to give? Because you actually know that God controls everything. Where do we get that from? Well, Daniel, in answer to King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, in Daniel 2.20, he says this, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He, God, changes times and seasons. Financial downturn, he's got over it. Financial upswing, he's got over it. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. What is it saying? God controls everything. 
That's why we're called to pray for our authorities, uh, authorities that are in place, not complain. Pray. Pray. Pray for those who are in leadership. Why? Because God's in control. See, many of us talk about this stuff. These are not revolutionary points. God owns it, and God's in control of it. Like, anyone ever heard God owns it, God's in control of it? Like, anyone ever heard that in church? Okay, collective, amen. No one wants to, you think I'm setting you up? I'm not setting you up. Everyone's heard God owns it, God controls it, yeah? Right? Here's the problem. There's a lot of stuff we say in church that we do not practice on Monday. And many of us live like practical atheists in the area of our finance when it comes to the belief that God owns it and, God's control, and God controls it because we're hoarding. And we're freaking out over recessions that haven't come. We're predicting uh, problems that God hasn't asked us to, tasked us to be with. We don't trust God enough that if we put the savings in the savings account that, that we've set aside, that he's led us to do, that he, if, if we ask us to drain it to pay $700 for a lady's car, that he won't fill it back up again if we're obedient to do what he's asked us to do with it. God controls everything. Psalm 135, 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. What's God do? What he wants. When does he do it? When he wants to. How often? However often he wants to do it. God owns everything. God controls everything. Number three, this was a big one for us. We believed, Morgan and I did, theoretically, that God owned it. And God controlled it. But here was a big one. We then moved to the place of believing that God provides for his people. God owns it. God controls it. God provides for his people. What does that mean? He actually knows your needs before you ask them. You go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Before Adam knew he was alone, God knew he was alone and was at work bringing Eve. Right? Before Adam ever goes, hmm, lonely, I'm so lonely. God was like, you're lonely, you're so lonely, and already at work. There's no need you have in your life that's taken God off by surprise. In fact, the Bible says he knows your need before you ask. He knows what you need. Now, I get the curmudgeon look, because some of you are like, no, he doesn't, because we needed this. There's a big difference between need and want, bucko. And you've been in a society that spoiled you to, the, to blur the line between need and want in your life. But I've met kids in Africa playing on trash piles that have more joy and less worry and a better life than you have with all the money you have in your bank account, all the debt and the creditors you have calling you. God knows what you need before you need it. And the good news is he provides for his people. Matthew six thirty three. but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Prioritize the kingdom agenda of God and the affections of your heart will follow and as a result of it the desires of your heart will be met because you desire God's kingdom first. This is not some kind of promise to you. And Listen to me, I'm not some snake oil salesman saying that if you will just give some money to the church, that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is way beyond that. I'm wanting you to put your finances before God and give him control. What is Pastor Russ after today? That you would lay it before him and go, it's yours. It all belongs to you. What do you want us to do? You set the standard for our family. Give us wisdom in how to manage it. It's all yours. That's what I want from you. I want you to still give your kids a Christmas. I don't want you to rack it up on a credit card, though, and not be able to be generous for five months or five years. I want you to still be able to go to Chick-fil-A and enjoy it and run into me and buy my meal. <laughs> Just threw that in there. I want to still be able to do that for you. But it comes with great intentionality and great planning. And you have to believe that God provides for his people. He actually loves you enough to know your need and do something about it. Philippians 4.19, God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You can live your life stressed and killing yourself over trying to hustle for money. Or you can live your life, listen to me, this is not a, a, a card to passivity. You can live your life honoring God through the way that you work, through the way that you gain wealth. And then through the way that you spend and steward that wealth. 
Otherwise, if you don't, you become a tin man. And the tin man started out as a lumberjack. And he went to go and cut down trees for his wife that he wanted to build a life for. But he got into the woods and he forgot why he was working. So over time, he began to mechanically become the tin man. His arms turned to tin because they just were there to work. So much so that in the story, the backstory of the tin man, when his wife comes out to the woods to find him, he doesn't even recognize her anymore. Think about how many of you lose a vision for why you work. Your kids grow up. You had the best house and the best schools and the best clothes. You have a retirement stack so that you can sit back and do nothing. But you don't even know the woman or the man that you are working to build a family with anymore. This is how money can deceptively become an idol in your life. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to pray, to budget, and to give. Pray, budget, give. Now, if you want to grow in generosity in 2019, you've got to, get, you've got to unfriend some stuff. Two quick friends you need to unfriend if you want to be generous. Number one, debt. You can't be generous and increase in debt. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. You know why they call it MasterCard? Because whenever you get that introductory rate, which there's a reason they can offer an introductory rate to you, because no one pays it off in the 0% rate, usually. Usually, the reason there's a market for it is you may pay it off, but the majority of the public doesn't. And as a result of it, all of those charges get rolled into that credit card. Now they're paying it 15, 17, 18, 19 percent back. The reason they call it MasterCard is you are never meant to get out from under their control. Pay down a thousand, and next thing you know, just in sheer interest, it's back up there in a few months to over a thousand dollars again. And you're wondering how this happened. How's this working? You cannot grow in generosity and be a slave to debt. Romans 13, 8 says this. Here's what I want you to be in debt to. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. If you want to be generous in 2019, unfriend debt. Some of you, that's a large elephant. My wife and I did a debt plan. For us, we can be debt-free by 2021. Working really hard on that. You know how we got there? The grace of God. I'll be blunt. God's grace. That's how we got there. Now, what are we going to have to do to get there? Well, a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> a whole lot of saying no to a whole lot of stuff. That's how we're going to get there. Will we get there? Maybe if Morgan doesn't have any more emergency surgeries. If the kids keep their teeth in their mouth and we don't have any more dental bills. But listen to me. Let me go ahead and help you out. You are more likely to have a negative financial event happen to you in the next 10 years than a positive one. Why do we save? Why do Morgan and I save? Because the rain's going to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And it's way better to pay cash when the rain falls than it is to be in debt to the credit card. Amen? The second enemy you've got to unfriend if you want to be generous is the enemy of greed and coveting. Greed and coveting. Let me give you the definition of this. Am I still preaching good? Is anyone paying attention? Yeah. Greed is the unchecked lust for more. Now, coveting's a little bit different, but you can't get to coveting without going through the road that is greed, or crossing the road that is greed. Greed is the unchecked lust for more. Coveting is lusting for the possessions or gift of another. So, greed involves wanting an object. Coveting involves wanting it from someone's hand. Wanting to take it from their hand. I believe the path of coveting other stuff starts with the unchecked lust for more. Luke 12, verses 15 and 21, Jesus told this parable. He said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Now notice this, take care and be on guard. That's, that's basically the Bible saying, pay attention. This is sneaky. You don't see it coming. It sneaks up on you and then you don't know how you got there until you look back and go, wow, we never saw that we were walking down that path. So it says, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Don't let your significance and your value come from stuff. Stuff. 
Talking about preaching this next year, I'll give you a preview of it. Abraham sets out with his nephew. Anybody remember his name? Lot. They go out, and Abraham has a call in his life that God's going to bless him to be a blessing to the nations. Lot would have known this. What separates Lot from Abraham? Stuff. Don't let your stuff separate you from the promise of God. There's nothing wrong with your stuff. What's wrong is when the stuff begins to own you. When you begin to compromise on what God put you on this earth to do to keep the stuff that, you've, that he's blessed you to have. So notice what it's saying. Be on guard. Take care. Be on guard against covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. There was abundance. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods. Laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Can I be very surgical (laughs) with what I'm about to say? Much of what is read in this parable is what many people do in their planning for retirement in America. It is a plan to move them to a place of inactiveness within the body of God. And removing from the passions and calls that God has in their life so that they can do nothing. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a gray hair or a blue hair, depending on how many times they've dyed it. And they've said things to me about sacrifice for the church or service in the church, that that is for the young people and not for them. Perhaps, stay with me, one of the reasons we struggle with raising generation to generation in the same church is that whenever you retire on the call of God to raise up the next generation by checking out and checking into what's comfortable for you. In essence, what you do is sit on the storehouse that you've saved up for yourself and hold it till the day that you die. Look, look at what the parable teaches. He said, I will do this. I will tear down the barns and build larger ones. Verse 18. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool. You didn't know what time was about, did you? You didn't know what work was about, did you? You didn't know what possessions and harvest was about, did you? Fool, this night your soul is required of you. Huh. I sat down with a millionaire that's had a lot of grief with his millions. A lot of stuff he's gone through. And he's watching all of his friends die. And their kids fight and argue and divide over the inheritance. And he looked at me and said, I don't want my family to basically dissolve over my money. I don't want to work my whole life, 70 plus hours a week, saving up all this money, only for my kids to not like each other and fight over it and then waste it. What am I here for? What am I doing? These are scary questions to ask at the end of a life, aren't they? Had another guy that was well into his uh, late 50s, early 60s, working 70 plus hours a week, constantly on call, never any moment that was off limits from his work, always working, always working. And I sat down with him and said, why do you work? As if no one had ever asked him that question, he looked at me and said, I don't know. He said, I guess for my family. And I looked at him and said, you mean the family you never can see or be engaged with because you're always on the phone and always doing work? Can I ask you some hard questions? Why why do you work? Why did you save up for retirement? Why? Did it have anything to do with the advancement of the kingdom of God? Now understand, like you don't like to hear that because you're like, well, there's, so, there's more stuff because you've been sold a lie that there's such thing as a passive Christianity that can be boxed down into only impacting one little box of your life so that you can have all this other stuff to do whatever you want, however you want to do it with no consideration for the glory of God. But that is a lie. It's a lie. 
Why retire? If it's not to further commit yourself to the cause of Christ. Why work? If it's not to demonstrate to your family what a good, healthy work ethic is and provide for them so they can learn how to steward themselves. Why? And potentially, could your lack of vision for why you're accumulating and why you're, could, could that be negatively teaching your kids the wrong thing? Could it, could it unintentionally, because of your lack of planning, be dishonoring God? I get it, it's a money sermon, you're supposed to wrap it up, but, but consider this. That you can honor and worship God with your wealth and the way that you accrue it and the way that you work, or you can dishonor him and misrepresent him and you carry his name. Which means people should look at you and go, that's how you do it and honor God. That's how you do it and look like Jesus in doing it. There's nothing wrong with accumulating wealth. There's nothing wrong with gaining riches unless you do it in dishonorable means or in a way that leads you to move away from God in the way that you do it. Some of the most godly people I know are rich, but they're also some of the most generous people I know. Not because they give a money money amount that impresses me, because they are constantly praying and saying, God, you own it, you control it, and you provide for us, so now what would you have us do with it? Some of the most incredible people I know walk in that perspective shift. So do me a favor really quick. Look at your neighbor and just simply ask them this question. Neighbor, are you greedy? <laughs> oh, this ain't, you don't want to participate now in church? It's not like I already know that greedy. <laughs> Sitting around them today because I knew you was talking about money. I was hoping they were going to get generous and it would like fall off on me. <laughs> you greedy? Are you greedy? You know, I have people come to my office every single week and they confess about struggles in their marriage and struggles with sin and struggles with all kinds of stuff. You know what? No one's ever come to my office to confess. I struggle with greed. I've never had anyone come in and be like, I need you to help me. I'm struggling with being greedy. You know why? None of us think we're greedy. That's what the parable's about. It's subtle. You don't get to the point of coveting other people's stuff, going, man, I'm going to wake up today and covet my neighbor's wife. That's what I'm thinking I'm going to do. It's subtle. It starts with an idea, a thought. It triggers you down a path. And it it does everything sin always does. It takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it has you doing things you never wanted to do. It's subtle. I've never found, and I found one story in all of church history uh, of, of where they dealt with greed and addressed it in the church. 1635, First Congregational Church in Boston, Massachusetts, brought Robert Crane before the church for church discipline for the sin of greed. Can you imagine that happening now? You know, like it's like, Jay Garcia, get up here. You, we, we've, we've recognized some things in your life. You're greedy. You have four Mercedes. That's a problem. You know, like, like can you imagine that happening? Seriously, think this happened. What happened is the church got together and they recognized that greed was subtle. That no one thinks they're being greedy when they're being greedy. So they said, let's as businessmen and women, let's set out what a standard is that gives us the ability to make a living and provide for our families, but not dishonor God through the way that we gain it. And they decided in 1635 that 4% markup was the Christian markup, that that was the margin that you can make off of a transaction. And anything above that was going to be greed. Well, Robert decided that 6% is what he was going to move to because he wanted more. So they called him to accountability with it. Now, some of you are like, that church sounds like they had Kool-Aid in the back and they all ended up on a ship, you know, that came by on a comet. Okay. But here's my point. If greed is a sneaky sin, and none of us think that we're greedy, because either either we live in the most generous country in the world, or nobody thinks we're greedy. Like, either either we're we're deceived into thinking, none of, I'm not greedy, not struggling with that. How do you know? Like, how do you know? Like, when is enough? Who sets that standard for you? I mean, it, or, or is it just get all you can? I mean, I'm, these are real questions. I mean, like, I'm asking myself these questions. Like, like, is there a moment in time where 
crossing that line and consuming, like, like that's, that's greed. Like, like th- is that real in my life? I'm asking you to ask, is there time? And again, I'm not trying to like black and white this down into if you have more than these many cars, this many, ha- like none of that. But have you considered it, that greed is subtle? And maybe you're greedy and you don't even know it. So here's what, in response to this, here's what I did a couple of years ago when I found this in church history. And here's what we did. I went to Daniel Morgan, our associate pastor, and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold me accountable for not being greedy. So every time I get a raise, or every time I get extra money, or every time, every time I'm going through a difficult time with, with finances and stuff, I want you to ask questions about how I'm doing with generosity. If you ever want to look at my bank account, I'll log on and let you look at it immediately. How many of y'all want to be like Jesus? I want to be like Jesus. I don't care if, if it means people have to get in my business for me to get to, to that place. So what does that mean? It means I have an accountability partner to keep me from being greedy. You've got an accountability partner to keep you from the vices of your life. Do you have an accountability partner to keep you from one of the most subtle ones that could be killing you when it comes to being generous? Here's what I'm getting at. Who's holding you accountable to not be greedy? I guarantee you ain't nobody applying that one, so don't think it's just you. Ain't nobody doing that. Who's holding you accountable to not be greedy? If not, how can you expect to continue to be generous if no one's watching out for you when it comes to your greed? So with this great message that I just preached on money that's got every one of you ready to give your life to Jesus, (laughs) let me just simply close with three questions. Number one, takeaway. What has been your plan to be generous in 2018? What's been your plan to be generous in 2018? Been, past. If you didn't have one, then you had a plan. Here's what your plan was. You weren't generous. You can get mad at me. You don't have to like it. Not been generous. Just grabbing in the money bag and throwing whatever you think is smart. If you've not been prayerful and intentional about God setting the standard of generosity for your life, let me help you out. Not generous. Because no one is generous on accident. Generosity comes with intentionality. Isaiah 32a is very clear. A generous man devises generous plans, and by his generosity, he shall stand. So what has been your plan to be generous? Number one. Number two. What will your plan be to be generous in 2019? Will you even dare to ask the question, God, what would you have me do? Baby boomers are mad right now. This is fun. You look mad. You may be happy, but if you're happy and you know it, your face ain't showing it. (laughs) I don't want you to give out a guilt today. In fact, if you feel guilty and you feel like, man, what I did was guilt you into throwing something on the offer plate, you keep that money in your pocket because I want you to worship when you give and I don't want you giving begrudgingly or acting as if God's trying to force something out of your pocket. Are you kidding me? No. We get to be generous. We get to do incredible things. If we end the year well, we're going to give over $300,000 in our first year to missions. That's planting churches. So yeah, I don't apologize for this stuff. That's planting churches, that's rebuilding seminaries, that's 33 mission mission partnerships we have all over the world. No, I'm not going to apologize for telling you you should give to your local church consistently and joyfully and sacrificially and prayerfully. No, I'm never going to apologize for you doing that. Why? Because we're making a difference around the world for eternity. We're taking paper money and seeing eternal gains made by it. So no, I'm not apologizing to you for that. And a pastor that does is a coward who doesn't want to disciple you, who desires for you to honor God in every area of your life, but perhaps the most difficult one that he doesn't want to talk to you about because he may not be honoring God in that way either. So he he shies away from the subject. You can look at my bank account. We continue to prayerfully give. And we will continue to do that and let God set a standard of generosity for us going into 2019. How about you? And then finally, here's here's for the advanced learners. Some of y'all want to go deep? You want to go deep? Anybody want to go deep in 2019? Going deep, 2019. Here you are. Get an accountability partner to keep you from being greedy. I'm not telling you who it has to be. You find a friend, and you guys go, you know what? We're going to be generous. We want to live generous lives. And, and, and by the way, Pastor Daniel doesn't just simply hold me 
to a, a state of accountability for being uh, not greedy with my money. He holds it with time, with passion, with my gift. Like, I don't want to be greedy in any area. I want to be generous. So if I'm being greedy in my time, tell me. Something we're constantly looking at. Who's keeping you accountable to not be greedy? If you dare to apply this message, it will change this city. We'll plant more churches. We'll reach more people. We'll do more ministry. I've got nine acres waiting on someone to come and help me fund what we got to do over there. You want to make a difference for eternity? Let's get single moms sufficient to where they can go out and live in the real world because we teach them to budget and help them get up off their, off their, off their, back on their feet when they've been knocked down. Let's build houses over there for them. Let's do it. It's floodplain. If we can develop the other part, you know what I want to do? The most unreached people group in the United States of America are parents with children who have disabilities. I watch students that come through our student ministry that have disabilities that are sufficient enough to do chores and keep up and make their beds and do stuff like that. However, they do not have any freedom and they have no next step after high school. So in England, back a long time ago, they started these things where they would allow uh, kids with Down syndrome or who had autism who were high enough functioning to, uh, to take care of themselves. They would give them the freedom of living with roommates. And they had simple chores that they kept, and they had community together. It extended the life expectancy for a decade for people with Down syndrome. You want to change this city? Let's reach families that don't believe they can come to church because they have children that have disabilities. And let's reach and give them a place for their kid to grow old and have, and have purpose and mission. Yeah, let's do that. Now, if you clapped, I'm assuming that you're going to be generous. I'm going to pray our ministry leaders are going to come forward. We'd love to pray with you about anything in your life, whether it's struggles that you're going through, victories you've seen, or worries you have. We'd love to pray with you. If you're struggling with the sin of greed, and God's convicting you and you're mad at me right now, we can come to the altar and repent instead of run. Would you move as the Lord leads? In Jesus' name.